How is everybody today? Let's, I'm gonna open up one other thing. Got it. Okay, so, um, let me turn down the mic just a little bit. Okay, so uh, you may have noticed that I haven't been streaming as much uh, the past um, uh, week or so, and uh, I but I have been in the shop uh, quite a bit more, uh, working on some parts of the subcontrabassoon. So in kind of a uh, continuing thing, I wanted to just show off some of the progress I've made. Um, let's. So, so far, uh, I focused on the body joints. Uh, these are the, the, so if I go over here, uh, so far what I've been focusing on is these, are these pieces that are kind of, kind of this fake wood. Uh, you know, the large body joint pieces, but there's also a few pieces uh, that are made out of metal. So, if we look here, this is the part of the subcontra bassoon that's kind of analogous to a bassoon vocal or the, yeah, the contra bassoon, for those of you that don't play contra bassoon, also has a tube a metal tube that descends past the vocal that uh, takes up the part of the instrument's air column that uh, doesn't have tone holes. It only has octave and harmonic vents. Now, the complicating factor on subcontra bassoon is that this part here is about almost exactly as long as an entire bassoon. The, uh, the positioning of this upper octave of this, uh, the, sorry, the lowermost octave vent right here is almost the same as the positioning of a bassoon's low B flat tone hole. So it's quite a bit of work to do. Now there are a handful of ways to make conical tubing because once again, everything has to be conical. That's a huge complication. Um, cylinders are a lot easier, uh, but uh, I'm not making a big clarinet. I'm making a big bassoon, so it has to be conical. Um, so of the various different ways to make conical tubing, pretty much all of them, or all of them that I know of, require a mandrel of some sort, uh, something for the tube to be shaped by. Um, now the issue with mandrels is if you've ever done, uh, any machining, you'll know that a mandrel's about the worst thing you can imagine machining. It's long, it's thin, and in my case, it's tapered. So what I would consider the unholy trinity of working on a lathe. Uh, so I've been kind of putting these off for a while. Um, but I did spend some time in the shop working on them. Uh, let me pull up some in progress videos or pictures. That's not quite it. So this is the sort of setup I'm having to work with. Uh, and this is one of the larger mandrels. So the, you can't, uh, so this, this part over here, this is called the taper attachment. This lets the lathe work on an angle. So first thing you have to do before any of this is dial in the correct angle. And I have a picture of that process over here, or maybe I don't, maybe I lied. Okay. Yeah. So I was having, you have to do that with a test bar and a dial indicator, uh, running the taper attachment over 10 inches and figuring out how many thousands of an inch the taper attachment adjusted and 
dialing it into the amount that you want. In the case of a subcontra bassoon, it's, well, it, actually, depending on the joint, it's between um, 40 thousandths and 52 thousandths over 10 inches. So that is a very shallow taper. Um, but because these joints are so thin, I also have to have a, a steady rest set up to keep the part from uh, uh, flexing. Otherwise, it's going to vibrate. Um, and you can actually feel it because of how thin these parts are. You can actually feel it when the when you hit one of those harmonic nodes of the of the piece of metal, and it it keeps getting louder and louder. The chatter keeps getting deeper. And uh, eventually, you, you could either cause some damage or ruin the part. And since these are a significant chunk of material, that that would be uh, that would be uh, less than ideal. So, um, and I'm also turning between centers here. Uh, I need to flip the part around. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a four jaw chuck over here. This is just a three. A, a, a three jaw scroll chuck. Uh, scroll chucks are great for just throwing pieces in and you know quickly doing some work on them, um, but they're not that good for accuracy. Uh, so what I what I ended up doing is I put a piece of metal in the chuck. I machined a center on that piece of metal while it was uh, without moving it. Um, that way I know that it's the point of that center is concentric with the, uh, the spindle. At the moment I uncheck it, it won't be. Uh, because once again, this is a scroll, a scroll chuck, so they're, they're not very good at concentricity. Um, and then I ran these pieces between those two centers. That's the best way on my setup that I can get uh, concent concentricity um, for these pieces that I have to, to work on from both ends. Um, let's pull up another. So, so this is one of the mandrels. This is actually the, um, the, the lower uh, the, the third of the tube mandrels. Uh, so Jared asked how I kept the work engaged. Uh, you can actually buy, uh, they're called, you can kind of see it here. Uh, this is called a lathe dog or a lathe carrier. Uh, they're designed to uh, clamp on the end of a piece to be turned between centers. Um, and that's what actually drives the, the piece, the, the, the dog has a little hook that comes in and catches one of the chuck jaws. Um, so you can, you're still using the jaws of the chuck to drive the piece. You're just not using it to, uh, you're not relying on it for concentricity. Uh, okay. So. Uh, this is, like I said, the second of the four tube mandrels. Uh, now, it's not perfect. Um, I, this one in particular, I may have to redo. You may be able to see here, there's kind of a, kind of a, a weird transition. Uh, this is the part where I'm transitioning from a short cylindrical section to the conical section. And I, I didn't quite do that right. Um, I, I accidentally pulled the lathe, uh, uh, pulled it back, which since I had set, uh, when I switched over the taper attachment, I tried to start further back. So I had room to feather in, but I forgot that, or I didn't take into account that when I pulled further back, it's also going in because of the taper attachment. And I ended up with this kind of uh, waste here. So I don't know if I'm going to have to redo this one, but the others were more successful. It also helps that the third and fourth 
tube mandrels were, are shorter. Um, now, sorry about that. So the, the big complication here is on the, the wider mandrels, I only had to reset the uh, steady rest twice. Uh, saves a lot of time. Uh, but the thinner you go, the the closer to a st to some sort of support, whether that's one of the centers on the end or the steady rest, the closer you need to be in order to for it not to, to vibrate. Um, so this one I probably did uh, had four steady rest positions. Uh, this one here, probably five, five or six. And then this evil thing here, this is the tube mandrel for the, uh, the, the smallest part of the tube. So this is where the vocal's going to enter, and down here is the tuning, where the tuning slide will be eventually. Um, and on this one, I could only work on like an inch at a time. So I, I worked on the inch closest to the steady rest, then moved the steady rest back an inch, worked on it some more, and it was tedious. There's a, the more times that you have to change setup, the more room for error there is. Um, you know, when you're working with the dials, the best case scenario is you don't have to move the dials um, because there, there's a limitation to how accurately you're going to be able to return to the exact same point. And I was having to work with both the cross feed and the compound feed, or the, 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 the compound uh, slide, uh, cross slide and the compound slide. So I had two sets of uh, numbers that could go awry. So this one didn't turn out too bad. Um, uh, I still think I could do a better job if I had if I was going to do it again, but I'm going to try these four and then remake them if I need to. Uh, sorry, I'm concerned that my stream went down. Okay. All right, so. These are the four mandrels, but what about, well, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, there's a nut, while I was in the, the machining awkward tapered cylinders mode, um, it was also a good opportunity to take a look at um, some other parts that I've been putting off. So, Sorry, that's going to be loud. Um, for most of the body joint, well, I ended up 3D printing the largest body joints. But for join the fourth, fifth, and sixth body joints, I'm going to be using a boring bar. A boring bar is a very flexible setup that relies on the, le the lathe's taper attachment to produce the, the taper. Now, the, chat, the problem is, the longer you need a boring bar, the wider it needs to be in order to not flex and vibrate. Even when you're working on something like plastic that, that cuts, that requires less cutting force, um, the, as you get longer and longer, you require bigger and bigger boring bars. So when we're talking about 500 and something millimeters for a subcontrous body joint, how big of a boring bar do you need? Well, <clears throat> you need this big of a boring bar. Now, I've, I'm going to apologize. It's rusty at the moment. This was actually, I've talked a little bit about the fire in the shop. Uh, this boring bar, uh, the fire was actually pretty close to where I store some of the subcontrabassoon stuff. Um, luckily, the worst thing that happened is some of the tool steel uh, rusted. A little bit 
but this is just surface rust and I can clean that off. So this is the boring bar that I'm gonna be using for, wow, rust is literally flying off of it, uh, that I'm gonna be using for joints uh, four, five, and six. The problem is it's wider than the bore for joints one, two, and three. So I can't do that. Uh, I'm, I would need to make reamers. Down. So here's, uh, well, right now this is just a reamer blank. So this is the outer profile. Um, and this was uh, the first one I did. So it's also kind of the roughest in some aspects. Um, you can see right here, there's a pretty deep uh, gouge. Uh, but um, yeah, so this is, this is going to be the reamer for joint one. It's the longest of the reamers. Um, now, I still need to throw this on a mill and machine flutes in this so that it'll actually cut. Um, but there's that one. Then for body joint number two, And finally, the largest reamer that hopefully I need to make, this one for body joint number three. Uh, Jaden asks uh, if I've made any keys yet. N right now I'm focusing on getting the, the, the overall body of the instrument ready. Um, after Once I get the body ready, if I have the reed and I have the body, I can start figuring out, well, like, for example, if I ended up needing to change a, a tone hole position or size, um, I can, you can manually cover tone holes to produce tone sounds on an instrument that doesn't have keys. You can't produce sounds on an instrument uh, without uh, the body. So that's my first goal, is getting the body. Okay, so these are the reamers. And like I said, I still need to machine the flutes in so that they can actually cut. And there's one other thing I worked on. So once again, we had the mandrels for the tube sections. But this isn't the tube itself. Um, the tube itself is gonna be a piece that kind of looks like this. Kind of a long trapezoid that's gonna wrap around. So you're going to hammer, well, what, the way I'm gonna try to do it is hammer it around uh, kind of a sacrificial piece of steel and then, once it's in kind of a very roughly conical shape, start trying to, to get it closer with the mandrel. Uh, and then, there, there's a couple different approaches you can try. You can actually, well, I don't have a, a hydraulic puller, uh, but what some people, you know, in more professional setups, what people will do is they'll get this, the, the metal in a rough shape, then they'll put this on a hydraulic puller and pull it up through a piece of metal that's softer than this, so something like tin or lead, um, to force the, uh, the nickel silver, which is what this is, uh, to the shape of the steel. Uh, I, like I said, I don't have that. Another thing that uh, they, a way that they make vocals is they actually use like a, uh, like a impact wrench. They just take like a block of lead with a hole drilled in it and an impact wrench and ha hammer on the end until it goes all the way through. Um, for, for, that might work for vocals. I don't think it would be too successful with these wider parts. Um, Brett Newton says, uh, sacrificial steel is the name of his, uh, his next piece. Um, 
so I, I haven't fully committed on what method I'm going to use. Uh, another option is actually burnishing on the lathe. So getting, getting this up on the lathe, spinning it, and taking a, a tool to, instead of cutting the, the metal, to burnish the metal against the steel. Um, I haven't committed to any, of the, any one approach yet, but I did go ahead and get all of these cut out. And I thought we could take a little look on how you might think that cutting these pieces is easy. Um, I mean, if you can cut this, then surely you can cut this. Uh, the issue is, uh, my dad's shop has the perfect tool for cutting this. It, my dad's shop does not have a metal, uh, hydraulic metal shear, which is ideally what I would want to cut this. So, I had to improvise a little bit. Let me pull up some of these in progress pictures. So, this is my makeshift uh, shear. I'm using a, uh, a just a plain utility knife, uh, clamping a framing square on it to cut the line, or where I want the, the cut. I'm scoring a deep groove into the metal with the utility knife. So there's a close-up of the groove. Uh, I was going about half to three quarters of the way through the metal just with the utility knife. Luckily, I'm working with uh, nickel silver, which is not silver at all and doesn't have all that much nickel in it. Um, it's actually a, cop, uh, a, a brass alloy. Um, so it was, I wouldn't want to try to do this with stainless steel. I'll put it that way. So scoring a deep line in that. And luckily, what we did have was a manual brake. So this is, this is a, a designed to bend metal. But by bending, uh, bending metal in a, a, a straight line, but since uh, I'd already scored the metal so deeply, instead of bending it or breaking it, uh, it sheared it. Uh, and, it, and it ended up with a pretty nice cut. You know, it's a little bit, you can tell that there's a little bit of a, a bend where the, the end curls a little bit, but I mean, I'm, you're gonna be doing a lot of hammering and forming on this anyway, so that, that'll be fine. And then, so these were, these were still square pieces. Um, each of these pieces here ended up making two parts of the tube assembly. And then come in and do another score, this time at the correct angle. Um, and since we're dealing with, I think it's literally 0 0.61 degrees, you know, a tiny, tiny angle uh, using a protractor would have been crazy uh, so what I what I actually did is just uh, in the in the CAD software I uh, generated a flat pattern and then found out the 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 width of these trapezoidal pieces now this is not an exact fit I've made it long on both ends that way after I've got I've formed it to the mandrel uh, I can cut it off and square it up, square up the ends. That way, because uh, otherwise you would have to try to do some sort of uh, complex arc on both ends and then pray that everything works out perfectly, which is not... Generally, when you're working with uh, doing machining... It's better to give yourself a little bit of leeway 
rather than needing it to be perfectly perfect. Uh, so Dietrich Labs asks, am I planning on making videos showing any part of the manufacturing process? So that was the original plan was, um, to, you know, kind of, to document everything much more extensively. Uh, the, the problem, the problem is when you're working on a, you know, working with some of these machines, you kind of want your undivided attention on the machine. So, and since I don't have a camera person, you know, ready to figure out what, um, what angles to use, where to position the camera, what material to cut, it, it's, it's very intimidating to, to try to do that while also running the machine. Um, it, it also makes everything take, you know, like twice as long. Um, so it is something I'd like to, to do a little bit better at, but for some of this stuff, I, I think the pictures are, might need to be, especially on like, I, I know this is like a classic first world problem, but you know, on something like this, when you're literally repositioning a steady rest 20 times over the cross part of one piece, uh, and you, you can't afford to be distracted. Um, and you know, you're, I was already, I mean, like working on this with my setup, I, cause I don't have a centerless grinder or a tool post grinder or anything like that. So this is literally just standing in front of a gigantic spinning piece of metal that can kill people uh, for like six hours or something. Um, so less distraction I think is good. Um, so that is the progress. Oh, actually there is one other thing. I'm pretty sure this isn't gonna work, but I do wanna I do wanna try it anyway. So this is one of the mandrels, and we have the the metal that's eventually going to form the 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 tube itself. One idea I had was 3D printing a form to clamp around the metal. So after I get it in rough shape, uh, instr instrumental headquarters, making a wrong move could cause large, large problems in my health. Uh, lathes, especially these like large gear driven metal lathes, uh, people have died. Uh, but so using these 3D printed pieces is kind of like a form to clamp around. Like I said, I don't expect much success with this, but I figured it is worth trying for like a, a buck worth of plastic. Um, Okay, so uh, the next things uh, I'm going to be working on are so, uh, the mand having the mandrels and the overall bodies of the reamers uh, somewhat or hopefully finished is a huge load off. Um, kind of the next thing I want to be working on is... If you remember long, long ancient days of the Subcontrabassoon project, uh, I put out a, a, a video where I was boring the pilot holes in these large pieces of plastic um, to, um, uh, to, to eventually ream or use a boring bar to put the, the finished bore on them. So I need to return to that, uh, get those uh, 
those six pieces uh, finished. It, uh, and the, so the first step in that is going to be getting the bore finished. After the bore is finished, then you can turn, you turn it between centers. That way you know that the outside is concentric with the inside because the inside is the most work. Um, uh, so Dietrich asks, how am I going to make the vocal? Will you just use a contrabassoon vocal? So it's different than a contrabassoon vocal. It's, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, it has a larger aperture than a contrabassoon vocal because, you know, the reed's going to be larger. But because it's shorter relative to the overall length of the instrument, I mean, you couldn't make a one meter long vocal. Well, okay, you could. People have uh, when they're doing like those um, those uh, uh, period contrabassoons, you know, with the gigantic vocals. Uh, but I don't want to do that. Um, so it actually ends up where the large end of the vocal is almost exactly the same size as contrabassoon, but it's a different taper and it's a different aperture. So uh, contrabassoon vocal wouldn't work. Um, I, I've put out some feelers to see, I would like to outsource the vocal to someone who does this kind of stuff more often. Um, If I need to return and make a vocal mandrel, which is going to be almost this long, but thinner, I will. Uh, but I want to make sure that I can't outsource that for a reasonable price before doing all of that. All right. Uh, so yeah, so these six body joints in the uh, what I call the wing section and the upper boot section. Uh, these are these are the body joints that aren't going to be 3D printed because I wanted them to be solid. Uh, because all of this, all almost all of the, all of the key work and most of the, sorry, all of the key touches and most of the key work is on these six joints. So I didn't want those to be hollow, like the 3D printed pieces. Um, and after that, return more to finishing up the tube assemblies. Now, I still need to make the pieces for the, the, the tuning slide, although to be perfectly honest, at least at the beginning, I may just 3D print a U-bend to go in that position to, to, to get started with. Um, okay, well, uh, real quick, I'm gonna scroll through uh, some of these questions and see if there's anything that I didn't ask. So Jaden says, imagine the octo subcontrabass sax. <laughs> There's a reason why I think the subcontrabassoon is a more likely to is more likely to be successful than a saxophone of similar depth because I mean a subcontrabass saxophone already has a bell that's like that big around. An octave lower than that, it's going to be like that big around. Um so Jared asks, can I can I just use a trumpet or euphonium U bend for the I think I, I'm guessing he's talking about the tuning slide. Um, it's possible, but if I if I had exact dimensions of something, if I had a piece that I knew I wanted to use, I could have made the focus the design around that. But since I didn't do that, I, I'm guessing it would be almost impossible possible to find the exact radius and uh, diameter that I'm looking for. Uh, so yeah, saxophone players are crazy, like Jaden says. Uh, I wouldn't rule it out that someone tries to make a 32 foot saxophone. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't think it would be 
as the guy building a subcontra bassoon and who has built a giga racket, I don't think a octo contra octo sub whatever saxophone would be reasonable. But hey, if someone else wants to try, go ahead. Uh, let's see. Well, here I'll just scroll up to the top. So Dietrich Labs asked, do you think a wood version would be too heavy to handle on a floor peg, especially sitting down? Uh, wood, wood is actually going to be lighter, is lighter than plastic. Um, so the plastic version is going to be heavier. Now I've mitigated that somewhat by making the largest body joints out of 3D printed ABS, which is both lighter and can be um, hollow on the inside. So with 3D printed ABS, the weight of the body joints is almost the same as it would be if they were made out of maple. Um, but those six Delrin body joints are still going to be a good deal heavier than they would if they were made out of maple. Um, but no, I don't, I don't, I, I have the, the bottom bend, the bottom frame assembly that is here. I, I've made this piece. I put the end pin in it. It feel and I put the whole or the the largest body joints on it. Put it all in one assembly, and it feels solid. I, I don't see any any big issue there. Uh, yes, Ratchet. I, I right now. I think I already said this. Right now, I'm focusing on the bore. Uh, okay. Uh, Ratchet asks, how many keys are going to be on the instrument? So, if you actually, if you go to subcontrabassoon.com. Then you go on pictures and video. Then you click on the design explorer. Assuming you're on a computer, don't. If you're on a cellular data plan, do not do not use this. Um, you can uh, find this. Uh, I'm calling it a design explorer, where you can look at each piece separately. Uh, but to, to answer your question, there's um, 20 tone holes, but in the, including the E to F sharp trill key uh, down to the low B flat tone hole. Um, very uh, the same as a contrabassoon with a low A. Now, unlike the contrabassoon and the bassoon. I am planning on skipping some of the uh, alternate key work. So for example, if we go down to the fourth jo joint and we zoom in here, we'll see I don't have a front B flat key on here. I don't have a front F sharp key and I don't have a thumb A flat key. Um, I did make sure that the design, the keywork design that I'm using could accommodate those extra keys if at some point in the future I want to add them. Um, but right now, for the prototype, I'm focusing on the keys that are necessary for the instrument to play a full chromatic scale. Um, with the addition of the E to F sharp trill key, because I want to make sure... Um, because that requ that's requires a new to uh, entire separate tone hole, and I want to make sure that that tone hole is accurately positioned in size. Uh, but yeah, so if if you, I mean, like you can really zoom in here and see all of the individual joints. If we go to the bell section, we have some joints that are actually named for uh, supporters of the project. So the the Newton joint named for our own Brett Newton and the Rennes joint named for um, 
Ro uh, Robert and uh, Christian Oma run us. Um, I haven't gotten around to naming the the other body joints yet, but that is a plan. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, so the the end pin is at an angle. That's just to keep the instrument supported as underneath the center of gravity, so that. I mean, it's not going to be perfectly under the center of gravity because that's going to depend on how far the end pin is out, but it, it's designed to minimize the amount of lean it's naturally going to want. Um, I'm going to want to play this from a playing stand, but if anyone want, was crazy enough to try it without having that end pin center under, centered under the center of gravity rather than just sticking straight down, is going to prevent the instrument from wanting to tilt uh, to the player's right because that's where that that bell is. Okay. Uh, uh, boss, boss, bass, boss, probably. Um, asked what would the brass version? What would be the brass version of the sub bassoon range like? Um. It depends on what you mean by brass version. You could make a sub bassoon out of brass. Um, even without changing the bore, it would just be a brass sub bassoon. You could um, make the bore larger and make a octo contrabass serusophone. Uh, there, there's no, you know, those would be out of brass. Um, the, as far as a brass instrument that can play down in that range, the tuba technically already can, but it doesn't do it, not with a lot of finesse, not very well in tune. And, uh, you're really, at that point, you're really running into limitations of human anatomy. Um, you know, as a, con or as a uh, reed player, we can just make larger reeds. A tuba player can't make larger lips, uh, and they can't make larger lungs. Um, so, if you ever listen to some of those videos of like those comically large tubas, um, they're pl they're playing in the same register as a normal tuba usually. Um, yeah, they might. It might be a little bit easier to play some of those real low notes, but the main difference is the partials are closer together. Um, you're you're just really running into limitations with with the the human body, and you know it would be the same thing with a uh, a string bass that was an octave lower. Um, you know the the human hand is only so big. That's why the the octo bass, which was originally conceived of as a the octave below the cello, but acoustically sized correctly, um, you know, doesn't even you, you don't even use your fingers. You you press little tabs. I mean, woodwinds are lucky in that we can take our vibrating medium and we can bend it into shapes. Same thing with brass instruments. Strings can't do that, so it just has to be. 14 feet tall uh, to, to get a string that long. Uh, Dietrich says, Benedict Eppelsheim may be willing to custom build you a subcontrabassoon vocal. Uh, I'm, I'd be interested. Um, I, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about anything I don't know about. I would assume that for things like the Contraforte, Benedict Eppelsheim uh, has someone else do that. He mainly works with saxes and clarinets. Uh, I'd be cur I'd be more. I think it's more likely that that Wolf makes the vocals um, for the Contraforte, and you you are correct. It would be expensive. Um, and, uh, 
It... What am I trying to say? It's... You, you want to make sure... On things like this, I mean, obviously the perfect scenario would be someone volunteers uh, to, to, to make something. You don't want to really go around asking for people to give things away. You know, that's, uh, it makes it seem like you don't respect the, the work, you know, like in the case of Benedict Appelsheimer or Wolf, you know, the amazing work that these people do and they deserve to get paid for. Um, so a lot of times I err on the side of doing it myself rather than asking for, you know, a, a bunch of, a bunch of favors and, you know, even even on on something like Wolf uh, getting a quote for a vocal, that that's still someone who has to sit down and figure out exactly how much that would cost in order to even give me a price. And if I end up, you know, not being able to, to do that price, that's lost time for them. Uh, a, lo a lot of times, people don't realize just how much work. Uh, in like in f fabrication or design goes into just get per getting quotes in the hope of getting work. So you wouldn't want to take advantage of that. Um, I'm like I said, I'm I'm still putting out some some light feelers to to see if anyone might be interested in this uh, in uh, making a vocal for a price that I could justify. But I I am. In the back of my mind, I, I am thinking that I'll probably end up making something myself. Uh, yes. And uh, then Dietrich also asks, when, how will you see the sheet music when you're playing? Um, if you look at the most recent, or the This Week in Subcontrapassoon episode before this, you'll see that I I actually did have the, the whole, or the, the bulk of the instrument assembled and, you know, in playing position. And I think that that's going to be okay. Um, I think it might require the, the music stand a little over to the side. Further than maybe we're used to. But I, I feel like that that is an overcomable challenge. The one thing I don't have yet is I don't have the... Here. So if we zoom in here we see these little tabs that attach the bell section i don't have those yet these right here um so that's why i haven't assembled the whole thing but i am working on those and once those are ready i'll be able to put the whole thing together including the bell section and sit in front of a music stand and see how big of a challenge that's going to be uh, bass unist. Sorry, that's that's the best way I could figure out how to pronounce your name. It's all cap capital bass unist. Uh, ask, is it possible to make a bulk out of something other than metal? Sure. Is it easier? No. Uh, I mean, uh, 3D printing a bulkal wouldn't be that hard, assuming you make the wall th uh, thicker, but you'd have to print that in like six different segments that all have to be glued together and then you have to polish the inside of the bore and then it's still not going to sound the same. So I do think getting a metal metal vocal is going to be important for figuring out how the instrument plays. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, uh, Arturi says perhaps the sheet music would be printed a big, big, uh, bit bigger too. That, that would be an interesting uh, music notation guideline that all music for the subcontrabassoon has to be at 150% size. Um, okay. Well, I, I think I've caught up on the questions. Um, I hope this was interesting for at least some of you. Uh, it's been a huge load off for me to get these these 
Mandrels and the Reamer bodies. Ooh. This is, this is hefty. Um, done. So hopefully I'll be coming back soon to show off some more progress. Um, if you have any questions I didn't answer, go ahead and ask those in the comments below. This video is going to stay up as a, as a, a VOD. Um, ask those in the questions below and I'll try to get back to them on a later video. Um, yeah, uh, D so Dietrich saying that he visited Eppelsheim's shop in Munich once. I'm very jealous. That, that would be, that would be a great place to, a great place to see. Um, yeah, and I... Like I said, the, the, the level of work he does, he would deserve to be very well paid. Um, and on the subcontract soon, I don't want to skimp. I don't want to, you know, I think I've talked about this in the past. I don't want the, the first impression anyone has on a, of a subcontract soon to be bad because I took shortcuts. But I also have to be realistic about my own uh, finances because, I mean, uh, you know, there there are people that have decided to contribute money, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. But you know, this is mostly a my personal money just uh, trying to make this. Um, so trying to balance those two concerns of doing it right, but also being able to do it at all uh, is uh, a continual uh, challenge. Anyway, uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, like I said, I hope to see you all in the future. Uh, everyone stay safe and uh, uh, have a good day.